Hi, welcome to The Garage. I'm David Shoneman. Have you ever wondered about taking a pile of rusty old vintage motorcycle parts like this and making them into something like this? We're going to show you how. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back to The Garage. On this show, we're building a new motorcycle out of a bunch of rusty old vintage motorcycle parts. And this is the third installment. Uh, if you saw the first installment, we took a look at some different styles of motorcycles we might want to build. And we took a look at also at the basic parts that we have for this bike. And we're now taking a more thorough inventory to see if we have what we need in order to make what we want. And the design that we settled on uh, was going to be a BMW, because we have a motor and frame primarily, a BMW Roadster. Now we're building parts out of uh, mid-70s, early 80s motorcycles. We have a bunch of boxes here that we got, and we're just kind of sorting through and seeing what we have and what we need. Um, the second episode, we took a look at the drivetrain. I had the motor set up here, and I had um, transmission and clutch and final drive, swing arm, all that stuff, all set up, looking at the motorcycle from front to rear to see if we had the major drivetrain components that we need to build this bike. Um, today we're going to take a look at um, the major frame components, again, to see if we have what we need to build this bike. I tend to keep um, a pad of paper and pencil handy so that we can write down the parts that we need. I've already been putting together some shopping carts online and whatnot, trying to find um, some of the parts that are missing. So once again, the motorcycle is oriented on the bench here with the front being at this end and the back being at that end. It should be obvious, but uh, just to make sure that we're all clear. The most obvious thing on the bench right now is, is the frame. We had the frame in the picture a few episodes ago. Um, this is a 1976 R75-7 frame. And the motor that we have has the same serial number on it, same VIN number. So we've got matching frame and engine number. So we're going to work with this frame. Now, we also have very obviously a tank on the bike here. This is the tank that would have been with this frame as far as I can tell. Again, the parts came from a bunch of different bikes over different years. But it fits. And um, we're going to be using this tank. It's in good shape, no major dents. The inside looks pretty good. We'll talk more about the tank as we move um, down the line here. But just like the other day, we started with the front. We're going to start with the front and work our way back. So with the frame, the first thing that we're going to do when we get the bike on the lift, and by the way, we're not going to build it on the bench. This is just set together for the purpose of showing what's happening. So um, we're going to build it on the lift. But we have the frame. The tank is just resting up here. And the first thing we're looking at is the front end. Now this is what's called um, the triple, the triple clamp or triple tree, different names for it. It's got a steering stem and top and bottom bearings. And this piece is going to fit into what I call the head tube. And that'll fit in there, and then we'll um, attach the forks. I'll just show you how it goes in. I won't leave it in there, but I'll show you how that works. There are a couple nuts on the top there. This top bearing comes out. This will slide up in here. This bearing drops on, and then we can spin this nut back on. And this forms the anchor for the forks at the front end. There are bearings in here. You saw me put a bearing on, on the steering stem. And the bearings in this case seem to be in pretty good shape. If we don't have to replace the bearings, we're not going to. Um, the, the frame seems straight, it seems good. I don't know how many miles were on this bike originally, but the bearings do seem good. So this piece would go on like that. We put this little cap on. This piece goes on and the nut goes together. This is the first thing I ever do when I'm putting a bike together. Now, again, we're not putting it together to right now for uh, permanent assembly. Everything we're doing is going to be just to test fit. And once everything is test fit, we'll send it out to the painter, and then we'll bring it back, and we'll do a final assembly. So we have a top, we have a triple, top triple, bottom triple, fits in there, nice motion. 
And the next thing we would do is install forks. I have two forks. This front end, by the way, it's called the front end, came from a 1983 R80. So again, 800 cc, that would be, it's doesn't matter in terms of the forks, but that's the model it came from. So as I search for parts, when I'm looking for something for the frame, I have to look for parts from a 1976 motorcycle. When I'm looking for parts for the front end, I have to look for parts for a 1983 motorcycle because the front end is 1983. So the forks consist of the bottom tube and the top tube. These, this is a good used set. Um, they're straight and there's no spring in here now, but this piece oops, comes off, it would slide up in here and go back together. So we have two good forks that will hold the front wheel. And we have an axle that will go through the bottom of the forks uh, that will serve as the axle, of course, for the front wheel. We also have calipers, brake calipers. Brake calipers bolt onto the, onto the fork and they will squeeze onto the front disc. This is set up for dual disc. So we've got two calipers, Brembo calipers, high quality brakes. These are not the modern Brembos like we spoke about in a previous episode. These aren't something you'd find on a modern Ducati today, but they were very good for the, for the era. Modern brakes will be better, but these are quite good. So we've got two calipers, we've got two forks, we've got good top triple or good triple, and we've got axle. And now we're going to come around and take a look at wheels. Wheels are down on the floor here, but, but I'll pick them up and, and show you some of the issues that we found with wheels. First, I'm going to put up a wheel that was on a BMW motorcycle at one point. We saw this in an earlier episode. This is a spoke wheel, and uh, it's the right size. It's great. I said I want to use spoke wheels on this bike. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that this wheel does not go with the 1983 front end. And that's because the hub, actually not a 1983 front end that has a Brembo brake. There's another kind of brake out there called ATE, and this would work with the ATE brakes, but we don't have ATE brakes, we have Brembo brakes. So this hub, if you can see it in the picture, has a certain width at this point, and the spokes attach on the hub near the edge of the hub and come to the middle of the rim. If we put this wheel on those forks, the caliper cannot fit. This caliper hits when the wheel's turning. So we cannot use these wheels with that fork. So what do we do? A couple of choices. We can replace the forks, replace the brakes, and then use these wheels. Um, I would have cut the spokes out and relace them and everything, clean them up. But um, that's, one, that's one path to go. The other path to go, I think, is a little bit less expensive. And we also have parts for it, some parts. This is a wheel from a 1983 R80. And this is much narrower at this point. So the caliper can sit, can attach to the fork, and there's clearance between the caliper and the wheel as it spins. So I had, I had this wheel, and it makes sense to use what we have rather than have to buy all new. So to use a spoke, we have to replace the forks and the brakes. Um, to use this wheel, we don't have to replace anything. And we can take it full advantage of the powerful Brembo brakes. Now there has to be a matching rear wheel. And it's an interesting story here. Um, before I started building this bike, I wasn't sure if I was even gonna build it at all. I was thinking about just selling the parts. And I decided if I was going to build it, I was going to use spoke wheels. So I put a few parts up on eBay, including the rear wheel to this design, this snowflake wheel, and someone bought it. So um, I found that when I was unable to use the spoke wheels, I wished I hadn't sold um, the rear wheel. But I went out on eBay and I found another one and I bought it. And I've got now two good wheels. Unfortunately, I had to buy one, um, but that's the way it goes. So we have um, vintage 1983 snowflake wheels that will go with those forks and those brakes, and we're good to go. We do not have the rotors, so I'm going to buy rotors. Um, I'm probably going to buy new rotors. I think that rotors can age, they can warp, um, just, just like they can on a car. 
Same thing can happen on a motorcycle. So we're going to use new rotors and, of course, rebuild the calipers with seals and new pads and all that. We'll rebuild the forks as well. So that's one thing we learned um, was that we cannot use the wheels that I thought we could. But we do have an option, and we're going to use this good option here. All right, coming back further aft, next thing we have is kickstand. Um, this is the front stand. These BMWs have two stands. They've got, like a lot of motorcycles, not all, but a lot, have um, a side stand, and they have a center stand. So this is the side stand. It's in good shape. Uh, we can use it. We don't have springs and attachment hardware, but we can get that. Um, but we do have a good side stand. We'll come back a little further, and we're going to take a look at a center stand. I want to use a center stand. Um, some bikes have them. Some don't. I've built bikes and taken the center stand off. It makes it a little cleaner aesthetically because the center stand, when it's up, will hang back here, and it's just something else in the view that maybe you don't need. This is a, a very typical center stand for a BMW of this era. It's a little narrow. It would have a piece off of here that you use with your foot to push it down. Perfectly serviceable. I have several center stands. This one is perfectly serviceable. I also have another center stand. Um, again, perfectly serviceable, but you'll notice a couple things. It's quite a bit wider, for one thing, and a little hard to see in the picture, but it's, it's shorter. This center stand is not as tall. This was an add-on. Uh, I don't know if it was ever sold as original condition. I have one like this on the red BMW, the 1971 R75, that I showed you in a previous episode. Um, it's a very nice stand. I like it um, for a couple reasons. One, it's wider, so when the bike is on the center stand, it might be a little bit less prone to tipping. Uh, secondly, it's, it's e very easy to put the bike up on the stand. This, but when the bike is on a center stand like this, this is called a Reynolds ride off, a ride away center stand. When it's on the center stand, typically, well, with this one, we're going to have four points of contact with the ground. Front wheel, these two points on the side stand edges, and the rear wheel as well. So we'll have four points of contact. Um, the bike will be stable. It might wobble a little bit, just like a table might in, in your kitchen. If you have, you know, four legs that are maybe the floor is not even or whatnot, it could be a little bit of a wobble. Um, but it'll be pretty stable. If we use this center stand, being taller, we'll have three points of contact. The front wheel and these two points here. Now, three points of contact means that it won't wobble because three points determine a plane. So the three-point contact will not wobble, and the rear wheel will be up off the ground, which is handy if you want to do any work on the rear wheel. We have a lift here and jacks. We can work on the bike without needing to work on the center stand on the ground. Um, so a little bit narrower, stable against rocking, but um, with the narrow footprint, maybe not quite as stable against tipping. This is called ride away because when the center stand is down, you can hop on the bike, start it up, and with the rear wheel contact in the ground, you can let the clutch out and drive away. It'll flip up on its own. I wouldn't ride it that way. Um, that's not my intent. But I like the stand because of uh, the four-point stance and the wide footprint. Now, the interesting thing is that, or one of the interesting things is that the center stand, of course, is held up and down with springs. Um, it's like this. Springs hold it up. You push it down, it goes past center, and it goes this direction. Um, these springs for this stand are readily available. The springs for this stand are a special kind of spring, and they're not readily available. So I know of one. We need two. Um, we're trying to find a second spring. If you know of one, let me know. So we need a second spring for the, the Reynolds center stand. We'll talk about the tank while we're at it here. Um, the tank fits. It's the right size. We don't have any of the mounting hardware in there yet, and we don't have it in our supply either. We've got a couple of things, but uh, most of it is missing. So we're going to make a list of all those parts, and we're going to get those. This is a fuel valve. The BMW has two, one on each side. 
and it's how we turn the fuel on and off to get to the carburetors, which will be right about here. This one is, it sort of fits on there. It's not quite right. There's a few things that aren't quite right about it, and it's used, it's old. I'm just going to replace them. So we're going to buy two new fuel valves. There's a right and a left because the outlet for the fuel valve points backwards. So the one on the other side has to have the lever facing out, but you want the fuel to come back this way. So this is the left side. We're going to order a new left and a new right. We may change the gas cap too. This is an original gas cap. Uh, depending on what we do with the tank in terms of color, we may swap out the gas cap. We have um, logos that typically go in here. There's an old one sitting right here. There's one down here that's, that's more like it normally would. I don't think we're going to use one of these. I think we might have something made. On the Moto Guzzi, we had um, a Moto Guzzi logo there, which is you're never going to see it anywhere else. It's custom and made for, the, for that bike only. We may do something similar on the tank. Next thing we have is the rear part of the frame. Now, this is, can't quite see it here, but this, this section, all the way back to here and down to here, is separate. It's bolted on. There's a bolt sitting in here and a bolt sitting in here, and this whole section can come off. I have um, probably four or five of these pieces. They're a little bit different based on the length of the swing arm and the year of the bike. This one, wherever it came from, someone noted on there that it's a 79. It'll work with the 76. It certainly fits, and it, it gives us plenty of length. I'm thinking this bike is going to be for a one-up rider, not two-up. So this frame is for a rider and passenger. I don't know that we need one this length. Um, we, may, we may use a shorter one. Um, this has good mounting points for the fender, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but we may or may not use this frame, but we have one, and it's ready to go. I'm going to take the, I spoke about fender a moment ago. This fender will fit in here. A lot of the bikes that I build, we don't have fenders on them. You saw those the other day. Uh, we don't have a front or rear fender. They can, they can certainly provide some protection against the elements. If you're riding and you don't have a front fender, if you go through any dampness on the road, you're going to feel that on your face. Um, the rear fender... Um, maybe not quite as necessary. If there's a panel under here, that can kind of serve as a fender to keep debris from landing up on your back if you ride in the wet. Uh, but this, these fenders are fiberglass. We've got several of them. They're in good shape. Um, some people will cut them down, make them look a little more modern. I don't know if we're going to use the fenders or if we're going to cut them down at all. But we do have fenders. Um, of course, no, no mounting hardware. But we can, we can source that. I'll just put this out of the way for the moment. And we have a swing arm. Now, you've see, you saw this swing arm before. We had it out uh, when we talked about the drivetrain. It's an integral part of the drivetrain because uh, this is a drive shaft bike, and this end of the drive shaft bolts to the transmission. This end goes on the final drive. Um, and it, that's how the power gets to the rear wheel. This swing arm is in good condition. We're missing bearings here. We're going to get new bearings for it, but we're going to use it. And this will go in here about like that. And it attaches with what are called pivot pins. We don't have pivot pins. So um, that's one of the parts we have to order. So we're finding that we have the big pieces, the major pieces. Um, but we're missing some of the small things like pivot pins. These are available new or used. Uh, in this case, we're probably going to get them used. Perfectly serviceable. And you save some money. So we get used pivot pins that will go in there. The shock absorber we're coming to next. Shock absorber, one end attaches up here. The other end attaches down here on this side. And on the other side, it attaches to the final drive. These are... Um, Old BMW shocks, they are from the 70s probably. I really don't know the vintage on them. I believe they can be rebuilt. I've never taken one apart. I don't see any need to. Um, I'd rather just get something new. So we'll probably get an aftermarket, a good aftermarket rear shock, and not use these BMW shocks. So it's another thing we're going to be picking up. 
I've got an axle. This axle will run through the swing arm and through the uh, rear wheel into the final drive. So we've got a good pivot point for the rear wheel. Um, I neglected to talk about foot pegs. We don't have foot pegs. Foot pegs would attach here and here on each side, and I, I don't have those foot pegs. So we're sourcing um, some vintage OEM, original equipment manufacturer, foot pegs for the bike. I'm not sure if we're going to use those or not. Um, used ones aren't terribly expensive. A new set um, would involve some rear sets, maybe moving the pedals a little bit, but we talked about the kinds of styles that the various bikes have. We're not making a cafe racer. We're making a roadster. We want it to be comfortable. We want our feet to be basically below the end of the tank, not way back here. So we have to consider where we're going to have our, our feet and then how we're going to attach them, how we're going to attach the, the pegs that we're going to rest our feet on. And then with the pedals, of course, we have to operate on this side the shift lever. So we have to determine if we're going to use a stock shift lever or if we're going to make something um, depending on where the pegs land at. So we have to get foot pegs, both sides. And of course, the right side will operate the brake pedal. I didn't bring that over to the bench, but um, we did not have a brake pedal for this bike, but I found one. In fact, there's a, there's a pivot, bolt, pivot bolt. The brake pedal attaches to the frame over a pivot bolt, and that pivot bolt, that's over 100 bucks to buy one. Um, very hard to find. Well, I happen to find a pedal and a pivot bolt on eBay for relatively low money. So um, you shop the parts, you can find what you need. Speaking about parts for a moment, let me just talk about where we find these things and how we find them. Um, for instance, the pivot pins here, or um, I talked about springs for the center stand and for the uh, side stand. There's actually spring attachment points for the side stand and I, for the rear stand, for the main stand too, which they're not on the frame. And you have to, it's, a, it's a little part. You have to find that little part. Well, how do we even know that little part exists? I look online. Um, I go to a BMW dealer's website. They have all their parts for all these various bikes on microfiche online. So you can go there and you can see what's available. You can order it right there or you can find a part number and try to source it used somewhere else. But you take a look at those exploded parts diagrams and you can find the parts that you need. You see how it all goes together and you say, okay, I don't have that thing. I have that thing, but I don't have that thing. What do I need to get? What's it called? And what does it cost? Can I get it new? And if not, where can I source it used? So we use that for the BMW, um, for most Japanese bikes, Hondas, Kawasaki, Suzuki's. That's also available, um, search around. Moto Guzzi, I had a hard time finding any kind of microfiche like that. So I was on my own. I had a manual, um, a vintage manual that came with the bike originally, probably. Printed offline. Someone else printed it offline. Um, printed it online, rather. And I got that with that, with that bike. Um, so that was pretty helpful. But not everything is in there. The microfiche online is great because pretty much everything is there. With the printed documents, sometimes things are, sometimes things aren't. Also, I'll typically buy a manual to, to um, look to see how parts go together. All right. So we've got frame, tank, forks, solved our wheel problem, working on the stands. Um, and of course, we need all the connection points, bolts, and whatnot. Bolts, the engine is held on with two bolts. I took a quick look this morning before I started taping the show. And I found that I have the two bolts that I need to hold the engine on. But again, those parts are available if we need them. Not sure what to do about the frame. Um, we need the pivot bolts for the swing arm. We'll get some new shocks. I have a front fender also. These fenders um, are fiberglass. And this part bolts onto the fork tube as the fork tube comes down. And the nice thing about using a front fender um, is that it contains this, this metal attachment point here. This, is, this metal part bolts to the fork tubes, and then the fender bolts to the metal part. Uh, the advantage of, of this metal part is that it serves as a stiffener for the forks. Not only is it a fender mount, but it's, it helps to stiffen the forks. If we don't have a fork stiffener, 
So we're riding along and turning the handlebar, depending on what's going on, the forks can actually begin to, to twist a little bit. So the wheel will twist the handlebar, but the wheel will stay going one direction. It won't be perfectly rigid. You'd like it to be perfectly rigid. So on the other BMWs that we've had here, I didn't point it out at the time, but we have a fork stiffener on there, a separate fork stiffener. Even though we don't have fenders, we're using a fork stiffener, and it's wise to have. The Moto Guzzi, by the way, has only a fiberglass fender for stock. There was no fork stiffener on that bike. And some people who build that bike now uh, will use a fork stiffener. Not a bad idea. We don't have one on that one. All right, so fenders, stands, frame, we're good to go. Um, let's talk a little bit about aesthetics. When we spoke about the drivetrain in our last episode, we didn't really talk about style so much. We talked a little bit about the carburetors, and carburetors have a style component to them because there's something you can see visually. We talked about trying to keep things clear in the frame so that we have a very clean look. But the engine is the engine. The transmission, it's the transmission. The swing arm's the swing arm. The final drive is the final drive. There's not much you can do with those. You could paint them, I suppose. I'm not going to paint any of the drivetrain components we saw in the last episode. We're going to leave those raw aluminum. I like, I like the appearance of metal. Um, I like metal. It just, it, it's, it kind of demonstrates or displays the technology at the time. I don't need to adorn the metal. And the colors in aluminum are interesting too. When aluminum is new, it's going to be bright and shiny. Maybe not shiny, but it's going to be brighter. And as it ages, it acquires some patina. And so our aluminum components in the engine and drivetrain that we had on the bench last time have a patina to them. We're going to clean them a little bit, but much of the, or some of the, what looks like grease or dirt that's embedded in there is not going to come off. That's our patina. And we want to keep that. I like to keep that. We can do a restoration back to, you know, pure stock, you know, right out of the showroom kind of a look. That's okay. But I like the, the, um, visual aspect of that patina and that aging that has occurred. Um, there's much more aesthetically going on with the frame and the components that I have on the bench today than there was with the drivetrain. Lots of choices here, lots of choices. And what we do with the frame and the tank and the swing arm and all the rest of this will determine what the overall look of the bike is. A lot of things um, we may not, when we first see a bike, we may not notice them, but they create the impression of, that dictates whether we like it or not. Um, and some of the bikes I had out the other day, we had um, that green BMW that had a powder coated frame, it was gray, <clears throat> a warm gray. Um, we had the red BMW that was black, the frame was black. Um, the Moto Guzzi, the frame was silver. So if you have a black frame, it kind of disappears. If you have a silver frame, it accentuates the frame. What do we want to do with this one? Um, I'm still thinking that through. In my mind, I, I think about what I want the bike to look like. And I kind of picture in my mind, if I have a blue tank and a silver frame and a brown C, like on that Moto Guzzi, is that a good combination? And in my mind, if I like that combination, I can tell, and that's what I'll build. <clears throat> Same with the red BMW. I thought, well, we got a red tank. I wanted a tank to be red, and uh, we painted it like that um, to match a black frame and a black seat. So those things work together. When you first see a bike, that's not the first thing that jumps out at you, but those overall characteristics will determine whether you like it or not. <clears throat> so what are we going to do with this one? This frame, um, BMW frames were always painted black. From a purist standpoint, we would like to keep it black because that's how they were. Um, but this frame has got some rust spots and a lot of scuffing over the years. Uh, we can't, although I guess that's patina, um, that's a little too much patina, and we're gonna, we're gonna do something with this frame. Now, we'll probably send it to a sandblaster, um, have all the paint taken off, and then, then the question is what to do with it. Are we gonna paint it black? make it kind of disappear? Or are we going to paint it silver? Um, that's a possibility. We could powder coat it some other color. Um, we could leave it raw metal. I may leave it raw metal. I've never done that before, but I've seen the technique. And it's interesting. You can't just leave it raw because it'll rust. You have to clear coat it. But we could leave it 
as raw metal. Again, I like metal and steel looks a little different than aluminum does. So we would have subtle differences in the color of metal if we leave it raw. We have the wheels. Um, that wheel, that's an aluminum wheel that we're going to use, the snowflake wheel. Some people powder coat those or some people paint them. Again, I like the metal. I'm probably going to um, save a little money and leave them aluminum like we did on the Moto Guzzi. The tank. What are we going to do with the tank? This is a big tank and um, it's, not, it's not super graceful looking. So what I found with with tanks is that if you can if you can do something with the paint you can enhance the overall look of the tank you can make it look a little more graceful or a little more like it was designed to be something this has cutouts for your knees which is great it's a big tank this is made for range so we're gonna have good range with this tank but what should we do with it you'll notice that um, the bottom of the tank protrudes lower than this basic frame line when we're building a bike we're looking at lines We've got a basic frame line here, and the tank hangs down below. On the Moto Guzzi, if you remember, or take a look at that episode, the bottom of the tank came right down to the frame line. So the, the bottom of the tank did not interrupt that line. We still had a nice straight line. Here it interrupts. And again, it, it's big. Um, I've seen some people have painted the tank in two-tone. They have a line here, <clears throat> so the tank below is maybe painted same color as the frame, and above is a different color. So this part of the tank will visually tend to kind of disappear if it matches the color of the frame, and if that maintains that line. So you paint this part up here, some very bright color, and now you're really seeing a much smaller tank visually. Uh, again, it's, um, it's something that's gonna affect the overall look of the bike and you'll walk away saying, yeah, I like that bike or, you know, the tank's too big or whatnot. So I'm thinking about two-toning the tank. I don't do the painting myself, by the way. I've got a, a painter who does a great job, um, Vern's Auto Body up in Merrimack. So I'm thinking about two-toning the tank. I've seen some people do bottom half and top half. I've also seen various patterns this way where um, this could be black or white and a very brilliant color up here. I'm thinking that I want to go a color that's really bright on this bike. I'm thinking about red. We saw the blue, a blue metal flake paint on the, on the Moto Guzzi. The red bike, red BMW and the green BMW, those are vintage colors um, from the mid 70s. No metal flake, just pure color, also very pretty. But I'm thinking about doing something very bright. Those vintage colors aren't super bright. So I'm thinking about a very bright red and somehow two-toning the tank with white, probably white, and then maybe leaving the frame raw metal. We're thinking it through, but the effect of the paint on the frame and the tank, that's gonna affect the overall appearance of the bike. One of the things that's fun about riding a vintage bike is that you ride through the countryside like I talked about before, and you stop at a coffee shop or a country store, and you just, take your helmet off, sit on the bench, have a cup of coffee, and invariably, someone's stopping by to talk about that bike. So it's a conversation starter. You're out there and doing what you like to do, enjoying the afternoon, warm sunshine, and then someone stops by to talk. And a lot of great conversations around the bike. So we want it to be distinctive looking and draw those folks because it's fun, part of riding. Tires. We'll have to talk about tires. Uh, I think that uh, we're going to use a tire on these wheels that is um, considered uh, a dual sport tire. So it's going to have uh, the ability to ride on the road, certainly, but a little bit ability to run on dirt. And the advantage there is that when the pavement ends and it turns to dirt, we don't need to turn around and go back home. We can continue and see where that road goes. It's not going to be a dirt bike, but it's going to have that ability. They also, um, those tires also have a little more of an aggressive look. They've got a knobbier type of tread, not a smooth tread. And that, I think, lends itself to the aesthetics of the bike as well. So we want to choose our tires carefully so that um, we have, we complement the overall concept. And again, the overall concept is Roadster. 
We want it to be able to ride the back roads here in New Hampshire and not stop when the pavement ends. We want it to be to showcase the engine and the technology of the age. And we want it to have um, not an overly aggressive look. We're not painting it, you know, black and putting fangs on it, that kind of thing. It's, it's going to be a pleasing looking bike, but it's going to have a certain um, aggressiveness to it that I think can come from the tires. So that's um, the frame story. Um, we're going to continue to do our inventory and we're going to start ordering parts. And when we come back next time, we'll probably begin some of the assembly, the rough assembly. Like I said, we're going to assemble it on the, on the lift first, um, see if we need anything, um, try to finalize our ideas about aesthetics, paint and whatnot, and then um, degrease the frame, probably get it to a sandblaster, and then uh, continue to acquire components and test fit it, make sure everything fits together, and then we'll do final painting and final assembly. When we do the final assembly, that's when we're going to talk about all the electronics. We haven't spoken about handlebars yet. I don't have any handlebars. Uh, handlebars are going to complement the riding position, so we want them to be up a little bit high. We do have handlebar clamps, and of course, um, grips and levers and switches and cables and all those kinds of things too. Uh, we have some of those, but we'll most likely replace many of those because you want to start out with the bike being fresh. You don't want to build a vintage bike and then think that you got a big maintenance item coming up soon. My philosophy is that whatever is deepest inside the bike when I'm rebuilding it, that's what I want to be, make sure it's right. So we're starting with that fresh engine. We talked a little bit about that final drive or tires or whatnot. You can easily change tires, easily change final drive without taking anything that's deep inside the bike apart. So um, the electronics, we want that to be solid, new, modern. Um, engine is in good shape, and certainly the transmission to be good. But if we, if we have something like a gas cap, we can leave this gas cap and change it anytime. So um, things that we really want to make sure are good that are deep inside we're going to fix and make sure are right so that when the bike is done, we're not worried about having to tear it all apart and to overhaul a transmission or whatnot. So I'll be ordering these parts. Um, we'll show you the new parts when they come in and we'll continue working. So I hope you're enjoying the show. If you are, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Uh, these shows are being aired on Nashua Public TV on television, channel 96 right here in Nashua, tune into those if you're able to. If you live in Nashua, it's only in Nashua. Or they're available on YouTube. Uh, you can take a look at them on our Facebook page. Uh, you can find us on Milliard Moto on Facebook, uh, Milliard Moto on Instagram, and our email is milliard.moto at gmail.com. Send us any questions or comments. If you have a bike you're working on, you have, you're looking for a BMW part that I might have, let me know. Um, Regarding parts, I may not be willing to sell BMW parts until they're all done. The moral of the story with that wheel is don't get rid of any of your parts until you're certain you really don't need them. And that's when the bike is all done. So when the bike is done, we'll um, get rid of some of these extra parts, extra side stands or uh, center stands or whatever. So if you like the show, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.